to another edition of the Holden Village Podcast. I am with one of our week six faculty of the 2023 uh, summer program, Lenny Duncan. Lenny, how would you like to introduce yourself? So I'm a writer, speaker, scholar, and a media producer. Um, and a lot of my work has been at the forefront of like what some people call racial justice in sure. America. I wrote a couple books. Dear Church, United States of Grace, and Dear Revolutionaries. I had a podcast on PRX for a while about like jam bands and racism, which I thought was really jam fun. Jam bands and racism? Dude. That sounds amazing. Because it absolutely kind of, you know, if you've ever been to a jam band show, I, I have been there's, to there's the absolute racism. <laughs> Right, so we did a yeah, we did a thing for Ben and Jerry's called Blackberry Jams during the uprisings, where we just talked. To, yeah, we just talked about like the common shit that would happen. Like, ever I've been going to see the Grateful Dead since 1991, and without sure. fail, there's some dude who's like, "So, ever been to one of these shows before?" And I'm like, Jesus Christ, dude! Yes, yes, yeah. I end up at VIP here next to Bob Weir's sister by accident. You're like, come on, man. Like, yeah, I, just, you know, I just stumbled here. I wandered here. <laughs> but like now I'm, I'm, I'm a student down at the Graduate Theological Union doing my last semester of PhD coursework. Uh, I take comps in the spring and I start teaching a course called A People's History of Magic. Um, and right now my focus is on, is the fancy way of saying it in case there's actually someone who is doing this work who listens to the podcast. It's a decolonial counter narrative to Western esotericism with a focus on black esoteric practices. And by black, I mean black peoples of the Americas. I'm calling it black magic and black power. Really, it's a people's history of magic, right? Yeah. It's just the stuff we were all doing when no one was looking, you know? So like on your way to church, when you grab mulberry bush to help you with your breathing, what, what does all that mean? And, and what sort of uh, really useful social and cultural technologies have we thrown into what we call like the wastebasket of modernity? And that's, so that's sort of where my work focuses. That's awesome. How would you like to talk about magic? Yeah, I mean, when we talk about magic or esotera, uh, you know, esotericism or mysticism or seerism or divination, I kind of throw it all in the same bucket. And so what it is, I mean, the pitch is, is that it's really just the movement and the rearrangement of symbols combined with medicines and nature with ceremony to change one's reality. When you hold it loose like that, it could be anything you want. It's the human urge to take smells and candles and herbs and minerals and praise the divine in some sort of combination. You know, it might be the divinity in you. You might be a person who's like, I am, that's fine. I'm just saying, but it's your way of accessing that. And so that's what magic is. Uh, it's a way of changing reality and changing our own perception of reality. You know, and the interesting thing about any of that sort of thing, like when uh, Jung talked about alchemy and that sort of thing, one of the things he really focused on was it didn't really matter at a certain point whether it was your view of reality or if it was if you were just shifting your own individualized perception or if reality was shifting around you, the effect would be the same. He just suggested you had a good psychiatrist the whole time you were doing it, you know? I think it's a time of magic. I think it's a time for people to tap into their personal power. Our leadership was incredibly afraid that we would tap into our personal power. They were incredibly afraid that we would do communion at home and be like, why the hell am I going here on Sundays? They were incredibly afraid that if you started to build community without their specific guidance, what kind of community would that be? And when I joined communities like that, the emergent communities that happened during the 2020 uprisings in 2021, as we continue to do that work in Portland, from everything from wildfires to, to indigenous land defense. And so that's why I think it's an important time for magic. I think it's an important time for you to know how to bury your dead. Call me crazy. I think it's an important time for you to know how to bless your children with water and welcome them into your tradition. Hundreds of traditions do it that way. I'm not really attached to how you're gonna do it. I just wanna make sure you have the tools to do it. And I think magic or looking at things more in that way provides that for people in really accessible ways. This idea that I that these elements can, can be combined and change and they can shift things in this room, right? That idea that I am empowered in my own home, that, that God has empowered me the same way God empowered the 72. How is that not something the church would be into? 
And so I'm much more interested in that. I'm much more interested in what has been deemed the miraculous. I'm much more interested in why the disciples threw lots when Jesus died rather than pray. No one talks about that. <laughs> Most important decisions ever. They're like, break out the dice. I mean, come on, man. You know, like, but no one wants to talk about that stuff. So we, we need the goddess. We need her yes, back, right? And we need her lessons for us. You know, and those are very specific lessons. Divine eminence, as Dr. Sherman puts it in my school, like that all matter is divine. The world around us is full of divinity and weighted down with it. When did you know you wanted to get into this? Is there like a specific core memory? Um, and when do you feel most magical? I was 10 and I had a dream that my granddaddy couldn't get up from a, from a chair. It's actually a toilet in the dream, but I'd never seen a toilet like that. And then he had a stroke the next day after I told my mama and a bunch of people about it. No one knew what to do with that in my family. And I had a couple other dreams that came true like that. So eventually they, they wrote me to, uh, they had me write my aunt Sissy, who was 88 years old, and hang out with my aunt Gussie, who the two was like the oldest white woman on one side and the oldest black woman on another. You know, my aunt Sissy would start sending me candles and saint cards and herbs, and I didn't understand any of it, you know? And, and my aunt Gussie would, bring me around and rub Van Van oil in my ears and say I had the, the best heart to go play her number. You know, like that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> and so I, I think the first time I walked into a place in Philly called Harry's Occult, I was 12. Harry's Occult was this place that was just like one of those watchtowers, you know what I mean? So yeah. they, they had to sign up Harry's Occult, fighting evil since 1913. <laughs> you know, like just... Just badass, you know, and they actually had a monkey's paw or a hand of fortune there and a few other things, like real ones, you know, and a full spread of everyone's stuff, you know, it wasn't just European stuff, it wasn't just Vudan, Hoodoo, or Ifa, it wasn't just astrology stuff, it was sort of like if you walked in there and you needed something, you were in the right place. I was fascinated by that stuff. I thought, you know, because from school, I, you know, from when I knew of witches and sorcerers and most people would get in trouble, you weren't, and here was a store. <laughs> A huge ass store downtown. They're like fighting evil, and like <laughs> people are walking in in suits and businessmen and normal everyday people who say they don't believe in this stuff, but they go in there and grab a bunch of items, or they have the person do a reading, or they're going to get a job and they ask them to dress a green candle they can burn in front of their house. And I'm like, isn't that so and so from? And so I, you know, that was the first time I really got into it. Um, there's a big tradition in Black culture of people who are practitioners because pastors there's never been a, a problem with that culturally sure it's one of the few places that black uh, men or people born male at birth or black folks in general um, could get respect as the pulpit right as a spiritual leader yeah. no, no matter what kind of spiritual leader you really were you know but you know most of my life I remember being like 12 and writing the Rosicrucians for so I could take their lessons and sending the money and you know and ask my mom to write a check as I gave her the cash you know and yeah. taking all their lessons and then taking all the Golden Dawn lessons and I, I always had a mind for that stuff I didn't know I'd be studying it on a PhD level when I was older right so yeah always had an interest in, an interest in it and always saw liturgy and always saw particularly church architecture as just an outgrowth of that uh, the churches attempt to do the same things. I love that you're bringing this to Holden because there's, I'm biased towards it. Like I love the themes and, but I also think like Holden needs it. I think it has its own repressed magic. Like it wants to release its magic. Yeah. And it just needs a little permission, you know, to do so. Certainly the land. Yeah, certainly yeah. the land and certainly right. this place and certainly the community, right? When we, listen, we talked about Paschal Beverly Randolph and, and sex magic. Mm -hmm. And for a bunch of people who started out the class as saying, I'm not sure about magic. And for a bunch of people for being like, I'm really uncomfortable talking about sex yeah. uh, in public. That was the loudest discussion part, <laughs> you know, of the whole class. Because people were delighted with the idea of what kind of magics or what kind of power, or what kind of divinity is just in you yeah and pleasure and joy 
And, and you're right, pent up magic, right? There's certainly that here. Um, people talk about it in different ways, right? Place and space and ritual and repetition thins a place yes. and creates these sort of things. You know, one of the things we talked about was, does it matter if A.E. Waits system of tarot worked the way it does 110 years ago? Because it's 110 years old, so every time someone uses that tarot, that space gets thinner. Mm -hmm. That symbol means that more and more. Yeah. You know, um, that the, the, those cards become something more in the consciousness of people. And is it that the cards are mag magical or is it just the conscious energy of people creating it? It's the same thing with Holden. Is Holden a thin place because it's always been magical or is it the thousands of footsteps that came through? It doesn't sure. matter anymore. Right. It is what it is. But yeah, that's here. That's here to be tapped into. And, and we'll see people look for more land-based practices, particularly in their Christianity. Oh, yeah. Final question. What would you say to someone who was thinking about either teaching or going to Holden? Oh, I'll keep it real in case you got a black person listening. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wasn't going to come to this shit. Oh, hell no. I mean... Especially after the uprisings, like, you want to go to Eastern Washington? And I was like, bro, are you kidding me? I'm like, I'm on Patriot Prayers, like, you know, their liberal mob list. I was on their hit list for years. So I want to go hang out with them in Wenatchee? I don't know, man. You know, but the truth is, is that, you know, despite that there is sort of like, it is in a weird place in Washington. Sure. And people will be uptight when you pull up in your car to fill up your gas. Yeah. That, it's where the, the Holden experience itself has been really great. You're not going to get around that, right? Sure. I mean, uh, so if you're a black teacher who's been thinking about coming here, um, I would say that this is a rare, this is rarefied air. For, any, for even hikers, for people who are into hiking trails, for people who are into national parks. I'm into national parks. I'm into state parks. I spend most of my time in them. And this is one of the nicest national parks I've ever been to. Some very rarefied air. Uh, and, and, you know, I, 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 talk, I talked about this on threads. I said, you know, I'm at a church renewal place and it's working and I made a side eye. <laughs> because, you know, you hear so much about Holden. Oh, you're going to go up there, it's going to be so magical. You're going to go up there and you're going to be so renewed. You're going to go up there and you're going to make so many friends. You're going to go up there and it's going to be so good for you. <laughs> and it's shitty because it is. At least for me. <laughs> like, I was like, damn, I'm so basic. All I needed was some prayer and some goddamn camp food and some walking around. I feel like a million bucks, right? Um, so, I... I would say that like it's okay that there are these sort of like tropes around, especially as a queer person. So many of us hid here for years. Um, you know, and on my way up here, I had lots of queer elders who were like, none of your shit up there, pal. You know what I mean? You'd be good to those people because it holds such a special place in queer Christian culture. And you feel that here too. You feel like you're on holy ground if you're a queer Christian, for sure. That, that kitchen, you know, that kitchen that has been, that has saved so many queer kids' lives. And I know that personally. I know that the Holden bread recipe has saved friends' lives. Learning that recipe in that kitchen, literally. And so that feels like sacred ground, right? That feels yeah. like amazing stuff. That feels like an untold story that you know could be told a little bit more. And so yeah, it, it, it's worth the trip. And if you want to come teach, I, I was surprised how many engaged folks. I did not think this was a crowd for magic. Just like I did not think that older Protestant white women would love to talk about sex magic as much as they did. Um, That's the biggest takeaway from this whole podcast will be that. Oh, again, okay. people, people will be like, well, that's it right there. You know, I, but I'm just, you know, people are game here. People are game and they want to learn and they want to have fun and they want to be exposed to some stuff. I've been invited to speak at a lot of church camps, but this one really, it really has struck on the formula of giving people just enough autonomy that they choose the programming anyway. <laughs> like, you there know what go. I mean? That's the trick, man. That's the trick, man. That's the trick, man. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, just a really engaged, open space. And it's just been great for me. So, you know, it's my first trip up. And it's just been great for me. And I'm not one of those people who never get... Because I think there's a lot of that, too. There's a lot of people who don't realize how little they see of nature. Oh, yeah. And they come here and they're like, Well, it's just so special. And I'm like, Honey, you're just not in service. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, that's, yeah, that's exactly. just the feeling of no one can reach you. 
Yep. And you've been able to wander through your day and you're not quite sure where you're going. And that's, yeah, it's fresh air. And it does exist. Right. <laughs> and so I think there's a lot of that, right? Of course. But it is still one of the most stunning areas I've ever been in. Incredibly beautiful hiking and just a really, and one of the coolest relationships I've ever seen between government, church, and community and yeah. private organizations. I, I just, when we pulled up, I was like, they just gave them this whole ass national park camp? I don't understand what's happening here. <laughs> I was like, what is happening here? And yeah, it's, it's, it's a cool thing. And so it's definitely worth, you know, the trip up. It's definitely worth coming to teach. It's definitely a thing I'll probably try and do again. I hope you come back, personally. Mm -hmm. Also, I think it'd be cool if like, you know, we did some camping too, you know? Oh man. Like, you know, really, cause I don't know if you've had the opportunity to like, you know, go into oh, like yeah. Cloudy Pass and like stuff like that. I have not had a chance to go to the Cloudy Pass or any of that, but I was talking to some people who hiked in and I was just like, they're like, well, I took the easy way, spider <laughs> gap, so I only had to cross a glacier. And I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, you're like, I just hiked all the way in. And I was like, oh man, I want to do that.